So, I watched this really awesome video by Sebastian Lag about marching cubes, which is an algorithm to procedurally generate natural looking meshes, where he used it to make a prototype of an ocean exploring game. And the video has been out for quite some time, but I only recently watched it. And it was really appealing to me, because the prototype he showcased had a subnautical look to it, kind of. Now, I love both Spinautica games. Very few times have I had such an engaging gaming experience. Even more than that, by the time I'm recording this, I am trying to get into game development at a professional level, so it really felt like I should make my own implementation. But wait, hold up. Who am I again? Let me restart. My name is Luis. I've been programming since 2015, that is, 7 years by the time I'm recording this and I am a senior software developer. About a year ago I decided that I wanted to make video games. I had already some knowledge of Unity, but I had no clue of how more complex systems of video games worked. Terms like shaders, procedural generation and artificial intelligence scared the hell out of me. So I've been taking a deep dive into many aspects of game development and decided I should try and make some content to share a few things I learned so far, and hopefully teach you something along the way. Also, you could say that this is my first video, or at least the first video I really put effort into making, so there's a good chance that it will suck. But anyways, I guess we'll find out. Enough about my personal endeavors. Let me show you my own version of a procedurally generated ocean explorer game with marching cubes made in Unity. I will start by saying that, even though the idea behind the algorithm is pretty straightforward, there's a lot to wrap your head around when you're trying to get the details of the code right. Luckily, Sebastian provided the links for the learning resources he used for his own implementation. So after reading a few articles, which will be listed in the description, I was able to create an initial version of the algorithm. I won't go into too much detail on how it works. Sebastian's video already does a great job at this. But the central idea here is, we will distribute points in a three-dimensional grid. Each point will be a vertex of a cube that we will call a voxel. And then define a function that takes one point as an input and returns a numeric value that is gonna be called the density of that point. The way we are going to interpret this is, density values above a certain defined threshold are considered as being inside of your mesh while points that have a density below the threshold are outside of it. You can define the density function however you want. Different functions will give different aspects to your mesh. For this first version that you are seeing on screen, I used a simple calculation with a random number generator. And as you can see, it does not look very natural, but that's okay to start with. This other web article, which will also be linked in the description, gives an overview of a more sophisticated way to build your density function. Moving on, I configured some fog to get this underwater effect, made an ugly submarine the player could control, and programmed some basic movement. Then I downloaded a free rocket model from the asset store, turned it sideways to make it look like a submarine, and replaced my ugly submarine with it. The link for that asset will be in the description as well. I also made a surface shader for the terrain to make it look a little bit more like the ocean bed. And then I added some lights and particle effects just to give it some polish. When we are dealing with procedural generation like this, our map is potentially infinite, and since we do not have an infinite amount of memory or computational power, we must be mindful of the way we manage resources. For this reason, I implemented a strategy for loading the map in chunks. So as the player travels from one chunk to another, the chunks that are getting left behind are destroyed and new chunks ahead of the player are created. This will not only limit the memory our game consumes, but it will also decrease the time for each render as there are less game objects to be updated. Well, so far so good, but you will notice that the environment doesn't look at all that nice. In fact, they are very low on detail and not very interesting or natural looking. To solve that, we must decrease the size of each voxel, which is going to allow the resulting mesh to be much more detailed, and to make up for it we must increase the number of voxels on each chunk. Luckily for us, changing the voxel size and the number of voxels is as easy as changing two parameters in an inspector. So let's just run it again and... 
Oh dear, that's not good. So, what's the problem here? Well, if you understand complexity analysis, you can probably guess that our mesh is not just too big to compute in real time. I will link a few resources in the description if you want to learn more about asymptotic analysis and time complexity. But what it basically means is that when we had an 8x8x8 grid, we had 512 points to calculate density for. And although 32 is only 4 times bigger than 8, 32 by 32 by 32 is 32,768 points, which is 64 times bigger than 512. So we have actually 64 times more points to calculate density for. This happens because our problem has a cubic nature. So say we have an input of size n. The time complexity of our algorithm will be n to the power of 3. So when n grows linearly, our complexity, denoted as O of n, grows cubically. So for n equals 8, we have n to the cube is 512. And for n equals 32, n to the cube is now 32,768. And you can see O of n as a factor of how long does the code take to execute. So now, when we click play, our games take 64 times longer to be ready to play. Not only that, but since we are generating chunks on the go, every time we move from a chunk to another, we will experience a noticeable stutter on performance. And to make our terrain look more natural, we would have to replace our random number approach by an approach that uses noise map textures, which are more expensive to calculate than random numbers, and our performance would decrease even more. How can we deal with it, you may ask? Well, this is where compute shaders come into play. The main problem with this first implementation is that it has a lot of points to calculate, and it can only calculate one point at a time. This is because the code is written on C-sharp and running on the CPU, and your CPU can only run one instruction at a time at all times. However, note that we do not actually need to compute one point after the other. Each density value is completely independent of the density of other points. So if we can somehow find a way to calculate the value for many points at once, we could drastically decrease the amount of time it takes for our code to run. And guess what? GPUs are really good at making multiple calculations at once. This is what makes them so efficient for graphical calculations and rendering. But fortunately, it just does not have to be limited to rendering. Unity offers an API that lets you write and run code on the GPU. This code is called a compute shader, and in Unity, it is written on HLSL, which stands for High Level Shader Language. I'm going to talk about the technical details a little bit more in depth right now. So if that's not something that interests you, skip to the timestamp that is going to be on your screen. So to write a compute shader, the first thing to do is to define a kernel. That is the computation that will be made repeatedly in parallel. During each execution of the kernel, we will calculate the density for a single point. To define a kernel, we use this pragma keyword that specifies which function is going to be executed for that kernel. Then we must define the number of threads that is going to be used. This can be a little tricky to grasp, so bear with me. We will define thread groups. A thread group is like a package that is told to run a certain number of threads. Each thread is indexed by three integers. So we inform the number of executions to the kernel using three numbers x, y, and z. So, if we tell the thread group to run one thread on the x-axis, one on the y-axis, and one on the z, it is going to run only one thread, because one times one times one is one. If we tell it to run two threads on the x and y-axis, however, we will end up with four executions. If we ask for two threads on each axis, we will have eight executions, and so on. Then we must define how many thread groups are going to be used. Groups are also defined with three indexes, so it's a similar concept to the threads themselves. The division between threads and thread groups affects the way the GPU allocates its cores. It is usually a good idea to have each group running a number of threads that is a multiple of 64, but be careful not to use too many. You are usually good up to around 500. Each thread execution will receive its index as an ID. This index will be shifted by the index of the group 
so each execution has a unique ID across all groups. If we organize the number of groups and threads properly, we can use this ID to identify which point we are calculating the density for. So let's think about how this can be done. Before we can dispatch the execution of our compute shader, we need to set some parameters, like the size of the chunk, its word position, the noise map to use, among other things. After this is done, we can use this unit function called findKernel to get the ID of the kernel we want to execute, and proceeds to set the parameters of the thread groups. In my case, I find that it's reasonable to have 512 threads working on each group, so in my compute shader, I already defined the number of threads for each axis to a constant with value 8. We know that each group is going to execute 8 threads on each dimension. Our chunk is also three-dimensional, and it has 32 points on each dimension. So it is only natural to create 32 divided by 8 thread groups on each one. This way, we can attribute each thread execution for a single chunk point. That leaves us with 4 thread groups on every dimension. Great! Now we can use the thread ID as a coordinate for the point in the chunk that we're currently working on. And then we only have to write a function to calculate a single density. To better organize my code, I initially divided the compute shader code into two kernels. One is responsible for distributing the density for the points. The other creates the mesh triangles themselves. For this overview, I will focus on the first one. Our kernel and our C-sharp code are going to communicate through buffers. Creating a buffer as a matrix is not very easy in HLSL, so we will represent the points as a large vector instead. Using a Perling noise map, we can create a density function that uses octaves of noise to create the density value. An octave is a sampling of the noise map that takes a frequency to determine which point to be sampled and multiplies it by an amplitude. Higher frequencies and lower amplitudes will result on fine terrain details, while lower frequency with high amplitude will define the general landscape of the area. If you're not familiar with Perlin noise and noise maps, I recommend that you read about it. They are extremely interesting and not to mention insanely useful. Now all we have to do is get the values back on the C-sharp code and provide it to the kernel that creates the triangles, just like we did for the generation of densities. And that's it, we have our mesh ready to go. Notice just how much faster it is to execute, and you can see how much more natural the terrain looks right now. You can also see how we are able to generate new chunks smoothly without having any noticeable performance losses. To make the project look better, I hired a professional on Fiverr to build me a submarine model that may or may not be inspired by the Subnautica Seamoth. I improved my density function to make the terrain more intricate. Implemented some vegetation. Created a shader for the water. A day and night cycle. and implemented some basic fish behavior to give a little bit more life to the environment. Okay, that's really cool, but that's not all that marching cubes can provide us. You see, if you ever played Astroneer, you know how you can pretty much change the whole environment by terraforming the soil. Well, Astroneer's map also uses marching cubes and implementing terraforming becomes fairly easy once you got Martian cubes working properly. All we have to do is cast a ray from the camera to the point you want to terraform. If it hits the terrain, we calculate which chunks intersect with a sphere that is located at hit point and has a defined radius. Then we simply decrease the density values by a factor of how close that point is to the center of the sphere. I created another kernel for that. It simply takes the old points and apply this function for each one. So I just dispatch the kernel that generates the triangles for the new density values, and it's done. A perfectly functional terraforming system. If you want to insert mass in the terrain instead of taking it, simply modify the kernel to add to the density values instead of decreasing. And voila! Now we can modify the terrain as we wish. With all that, 
we have a pretty decent ocean environment and some basic exploring systems that you can see on screen. Of course, I omitted some polishing details that are not so important for this video's goal, like how the water works or how the fog works, but the point here is to talk about compute shaders in Martian cubes. So if you want to see how these things are made, it is all available on my GitHub. I will leave a link to the repository in the description. You will also find a better explanation of how Martian cubes works there. Unfortunately, some assets I used are not open source, like the foliage, some particle effects and the sky material, so I could not make them publicly available on GitHub. But the code should work if you replace them with any placeholder assets. You can also, of course, just use the compute shaders to generate mesh in your own Unity project. So that's what I had to share. Thank you for watching, hope you liked it. If you did, consider subscribing and you would really help me a lot by leaving a like. I might do some other videos like this in the future, or perhaps this will be the only one, who knows. But anyways, if you have any suggestions, questions, or if I missed anything, feel free to point it out in the comments. Thanks again and see you next time.